Hi, I'm Chuck DeVore. I'm the Vice President for National Initiatives at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And I'm joined today by two remarkable individuals to talk about a very difficult and intractable uh, policy challenge, a very human challenge that we've had uh, in America, uh, basically intensifying over the last 50 years, uh, perhaps not so curiously as the federal government has increasingly tried to address the problem. Uh, we're joined today uh, with, uh, to discuss poverty in America by Chris Rufo. He is uh, at the Discovery Institute Center for Wealth and Poverty. He's the director of that center. Uh, and as well by Ovik Roy. Ovik is also here in Austin, Texas. He is the president of the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity uh, and is also a public health uh, expert. Uh, knows everything there is to know about health insurance and, and uh, <laughs> the way we provide care to individuals. Uh, so, uh, gentlemen, uh, let's uh, start with, with Chris. Um, we've seen your film, uh, your, your documentary, America Lost, uh, and it presents uh, some kind of unsettling pictures of America, certainly pictures of America that most Americans might feel a bit uncomfortable viewing. Uh, you focused on three cities. Um, could you tell us uh, how you came to pick those three cities and tell us a bit about the documentary? I also understand uh, you're due to go on PBS later this year with it. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. So the, the film really emerged um, trying to uh, take some of the kind of foundational ideas and social science and kind of some of the great uh, conservative social science books I've read and actually put a human face to it. and. I, I, in addressing the kind of broader issue of poverty, I wanted to make sure that it was presented in a way that couldn't be dismissed by a single city location. Because if you make a film about Detroit, uh, it's a film about Detroit, uh, not a film about some broader theme. And so I, I wanted to do uh, three cities in a kind of a triptych format. So uh, a kind of one, two, three format, finding three cities that represented the geographic uh, kind of principal geographic areas of the United States, a northern industrial city, uh, a kind of southern city, and then a western city. And this also reflects, and I think very importantly, the three kind of largest uh, racial groups in the country. You have white working class in Youngstown, kind of a black urban neighborhood in Memphis, and then a Latino and multiracial community in Stockton. So it represents simultaneously the three the main geographic areas, the three main racial groups, and really comes down to the idea that the struggles that they're going through in America's poorest communities really are, 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 are different reflections and intensities uh, based on race and geography, but fundamentally they're struggling with those same problems. So it shows that these are really no longer uh, predominantly correlated with race or even kind of the loss of industry in a region but are really universal problems for America's poor. And, you know, the, the film is interesting. I, I, I spent, you know, more than 10 years in the documentary field. Uh, it's a field that is really quite clearly a, a very progressive field. Uh, the, the kind of institutions and the mindset and the ideology that dominates uh, is really very far to the left. So it's been kind of an interesting process to navigate uh, this kind of industry and field with a film that is from a decidedly center right perspective. Um, but, you know, fortunately was able to kind of create a film that was, uh, had a clear point of view, a clear perspective, uh, but isn't really perceived as partisan or extremely ideological. Um, and was able to kind of navigate it to do what I've done for three previous films, which is to secure a national PBS broadcast. And, you know, that's, that's really the, the hope for the film is to present a kind of new view on the realities of poverty in America and present you know, the, the idea that maybe our system uh, is broken, is flawed, and uh, we need some significant change. Ovik, uh, it's been now, what, 55 years or so since uh, President Lyndon Baines Johnson uh, you know, instituted the war on poverty. And by some measures, you could say there has been some success, at least with material poverty but in other measures explored by Chris Rufo's film, uh, America Lost, it seems like we've lost, for example, the issue of social capital. Uh, could you, you know, discuss this dichotomy between, on one hand, uh, government money 
at least appearing to alleviate some of the material aspects of poverty versus the issue that Chris raised in his film about social capital. Yeah, you know, actually we're almost at 55 years of the anniversary of the passage and enactment of Medicare and Medicaid on the dot uh, in 1965 and a lot, of, a lot of other major social legislation as well. And it was interesting, Chris, hearing you talk about uh, the social thinkers that, that inspired you to, uh, to, to, to put this film together and some of your other ones, because obviously Charles Murray, who's credited in your film, and Charles Murray's a guy who's written a lot. He wrote the original book, right? Losing Ground was all about this idea that, uh, that the war on poverty, 15 years on, he was writing his book based on the data from 65 to 80, uh, that the war on poverty had not materially changed the rate of poverty. Um, and and your, uh, your film illustrates that to agree. And, and you know, one thing I'm, I'm, I'm interested in is uh, there, sometimes the, uh, the takeaway is, and, and you, you suggest this to a bit in, in, in some of your narrative, or your narration that, well, uh, there's no there's no policy that can work. And, you know, the, every president has tried. You have that great uh, montage of the various presidents and, the, and making speeches and signing bills. Every president's tried to do something about this. They've all failed. There's something uh, spiritual or personal or human or individual where you have to build out from. And I thought that was interesting because, um, uh, you know, I, I, I certainly as a think tank guy, maybe that's my bias and maybe and maybe Chuck's as well. But we obviously spent a lot of time thinking about both of these elements, both the spiritual and human element that you need, but also how public policy has corroded uh, the spiritual and human element and how public policy can change uh, uh, to improve that. And the other piece of it, just to go back to something you said, Chris, is I thought it was really, really great what you did in terms of strategically thinking about you start with Youngstown. And I think pretty much everybody who you filmed in that Youngstown uh, segment was white. And then you go to Memphis where the opposite was true and it, almost everyone was black. And then you go to Stockton and you did a really, really nice job of describing how these are problems faced by every community. And I would suggest that one of the things that we conservatives or libertarians need to do better maybe is, is appreciate that commonality. It used to be 25 years ago as fashionable to say, well, the problems that are going on in the inner city are the problems of uh, irresponsibility. People are having kids out of wedlock and that's their fault. People are doing drugs, that's their fault. People are, are committing crimes, that's their fault. It's not our fault. We don't have any uh, stake or agency or involvement in what's going on there. They've got to figure out their own problems. And I wonder if part of what uh, I draw from your film is that we need to do a lot better job of investing in the problems of all Americans on a human level. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And I think that, you know, to, to, to kind of tackle your first point, I think, you know, the montage of presidents that are essentially uh, changing or redirecting or making slight modifications to the general kind of philosophical framework of the Great Society programs. Uh, I, I think we can conclude that the Great Society programs um, haven't achieved their objective. I mean, the objective was to eliminate poverty. It's not true. And I think in many measures, you have this paradox where the kind of technical household income uh, is actually gone up since the 1960s. And yet the more human measures that actually impact people in their real life has really collapsed. So, you know, in Memphis, for example, the 38126 zip code has 92% of all households are single parent households. Uh, if you look at the you know, west side of Youngstown, all of the old churches and civic halls and kind of community organizations are literally boarded up and abandoned and used as kind of drug trap houses. So I, I think that we're in this kind of bizarre moment where we have this kind of status quo infrastructure that doesn't work. And I think the, the reforms that we've tried have been really not fundamental enough. And I think that in my view, and uh, I, I wouldn't be as bold uh, to, to say I have the answer, but I think we need to think much bigger uh, than the kind of changes around the edges um, in how we rethink the Great Society. And I think the basic premise of the Great Society was that we are going to apply social science to social problems and solve them. Um, and I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if the evidence is strong that the the basic framework with the lay, that we laid out works. And I, I think the the second question is a really important one. And I started with Youngstown very deliberately because I think that you know there has been for too long a 
kind of a, a false correlation of poverty and social problems with minority communities. And I mean, certainly like a lot of these problems statistically are more intense in those communities, but it's by no means limited to those communities. And actually what I discovered is precisely the opposite. If you look at Stockton, for example, it's a quarter black, a quarter white, a quarter Latino and a quarter Asian, predominantly Southeast Asian recent immigrants. And in something that's not in the film, but is really interesting is even the street gangs, which in most cities are organized on racial lines in Stockton, California are organized on block by block geographies. So I hung out with gang, uh, gang members who were in a gang where you'd have a black guy, a white guy, a, 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 a Hmong or Laotian guy, a Native American guy and a Latino guy that were kind of fighting against another multiracial gang. So I, I think that it's really crucial and I hope that it, you know, motivates people to say, this is a problem that affects everyone. This is a problem that affects people of all backgrounds. And we all have a huge stake in the outcomes of people uh, that are growing up in these communities. And, and I think that we need to kind of reach out as maybe on the more free market side or conservative or liber liber libertarian side, uh, realize that these social problems are, in my view, the defining problem of our time. Uh, and it's gonna take a huge uh, emotional, uh, community, voluntary, and public policy investment. So Chris, um, and both uh, both you and Ovik, I think have hinted at this, wasn't all of this predicted back in 1965 by a then uh, rather obscure Department of Labor economist named Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who later went on to serve a, a few terms in the U.S. Senate from New York. Uh, in Moynihan's 1965 report, which I think very few people have read, even though it's not all that long, uh, The Negro Family, The Case for National Action, there's something uh, that it seems like everybody forgets in his report, which was that based on data, he was very concerned that if there were new programs launched to help impoverished Americans, and specifically in this case, uh, African Americans, that his fear was that unless that aid was conditioned on work or education, that it would lead to a destruction, to, a, to a, an erosion of the black family unit. And he predicted that what would happen because of that would be increased out of wedlock birth, increased crime. Um, we've seen all of that happen that he predicted. Why, why is this such a shock to people when it seemed so clearly obvious back in 1965? You know, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll weigh in and then and then defer to Ovik. But you know, my sense is that that moment was decisive in uh, uh, both a good way and and a very bad way. Is that the Moynihan report, which I think is is has shown to be quite true, quite prescient. Uh, if if anything, those problems have actually gone much worse uh, than he predicted uh, and affected now all groups. Um, I, I think he diagnosed the problem correctly and provides still some critical insight. And even the New York Times has had op-eds in the last three or four years saying, well, as liberals, we should really look at the Moynihan report and, and, and maybe he had a good point to make. But at the same time, the, the real negative consequence that is with us to this day is that the family is a taboo topic of political discussion. Uh, you can get in a lot of trouble for talking about the family. And it's something that is, to me, just absolutely bizarre because there's nothing that is more universal or important or meaningful in, in people's lives than the family uh, connection, the family bond, the family structure, uh, the, the family as the basis uh, for life and community. And yet it is really a kind of third rail in, in our public discourse. And I think the, the, the real thing that I learned making this film is that while the family is taboo uh, on the kind of op-ed pages of the New York Times or within the university or within the kind of elite discourse, uh, if you actually spend time in these poor communities, that, that loss of family is something that people feel and discuss every day. And there was nothing more important uh, that, that I talked about with people. Again, con I conducted more than a thousand interviews over three years in the poorest neighborhoods in the United States. And the theme that struck the deepest, that really uh, uh, kind of emanated from the community and the individuals uh, that I was uh, talking to, family, family, family. They knew, uh, they felt the kind of keen loss of family and they knew the family 
kind of structure and stability and strength was the key for them to emerge from this crisis. Uh, and, and yet at the elite discourse level, it's something that is uh, almost uh, never discussed. You know, that, that Daniel Patrick Moynihan report uh, from 1965, if I recall the date correctly, it's, it's, a, it's definitely something everyone should read. Uh, I, a lot of different directions I, I could take your question, Chuck. First, it's worth noting that Daniel Patrick, or emphasizing that Daniel Patrick Moynihan was no libertarian. Um, he, you know, some people would have called him a neoconservative back when neoconservative it didn't have anything to do with Iraq, but was about domestic policy. But he was a guy who was adamantly against the 1996 welfare reform that Newt Ging the Newt Gingrich Congress and, and Bill Clinton, then president, uh, uh, enacted. So while he, he was very concerned about the disintegration of the black family, I, I don't know if he would agree with the statement that the great society in its totality was bad policy. He supported lots of it, just maybe not uh, parts of it. Uh, another thing that's worth mentioning is that uh, we can't ignore the legacy of slavery and segregation in this conversation about the black family in particular, right? So there was already a lot of disruption and instability and fragility in the black family when the great society was instituted. And a big part of what I take away from Chris's film in a sense is the importance of community. Both what the great society doubled down on and what existed before were communities in which poverty was concentrated in given areas. If you, if you think about Raj Chetty's work in particular, one of the things that, that you can take away from Raj Chetty's work, who, for those of you who are not familiar with Raj Chetty, he's a, uh, an economist who studies social mobility. He's been at Harvard and Stanford, principally, I think he's, at, he's back at Harvard now. Uh, he's done some tremendous uh, work on this, and empirical research on this topic about how, how important it is where you grow up and if you take the same person with the same family structure, broken or not, and take that person, put drop him or her in an upper middle class suburb, all of a sudden their educational attainment is better, their economic outcomes are better, their health outcomes are better. So one of the things that we did with the Great Society that, that I think has, has uh, reinforced the problems that already existed, you had segregation. You had poor black families uh, forced to live in, in uh, particular parts of town. In the case of Austin, it was the, the East Austin, East of I-35. Um, and today still, those areas are the more impoverished parts of cities and communities around the country. And as a result, when it comes to things like the way you pay for public schools or the way you pay for local services, uh, uh, those, those generations old policies do end up having an effect. And so the Great Society tried in, in its perhaps its more uh, uh, redeemable parts to try to correct some of those problems. I'd like to explore something that I kind of discovered or at least uh, my, my eyes were opened a little bit um, a few months ago. And, and I think it goes to the, the core of some of the things that Chris was saying in his film. Uh, man is not merely material. Right, we don't survive off of bread alone, and so it seems to me, though, that that some of the core foundational philosophies that often animate the discussions about poverty have their basis in either Marxism or libertarianism, and it strikes me that both philosophies view mankind as a material creature, as a as a kind of a Homo economicus. Um, what do you th what do you say about perhaps the the shortcomings of viewing uh, people through merely dollars and cents and material well being? You know that that is I think really hits the nail on the head, and I, I think I've learned that Marxism and libertarianism in many ways are the uh, opposite side of the same coin, especially in this issue that you're discussing. And I'll, I'll kind of put it this way. I, I started the film as a libertarian and I finished the film as a conservative uh, because I, I really kind of had a deeper understanding and a learning of the limitations of the kind of material first and sometimes material only um, uh, approach to public policy, approach to, to human society. And, and I think that... Um, you know, it's really, truly not just a material question. I mean, certainly it is a material question. And in many cases, uh, that's an important part. But, you know, one of the things that happened when I was making the film that I think really took, 
took this lesson and, and drove it home is that uh, I'm a, a, a Italian citizen, American citizen, and uh, have family in, in, in both places. And uh, as I was making the film, some of the summers, I would go visit our village in Italy. And the, the village that we are from, it's about 2,000 people. It's extremely impoverished. Uh, it would be definitely in the lowest 10% or certainly the lowest 20% of, of per capita income if you compared it to the United States. And yet it has a extremely vibrant and robust and functioning culture and, and society. So it has strong families, it has a strong local culture, it has a strong kind of arts and intellectual uh, kind of community, even with low levels of education and, 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 and kind of rudimentary uh, e economic structures. And it really kind of showed me that there is a limit to uh, only thinking in terms of economics, only even thinking in terms of mobility, uh, because you are, you are, I mean, I think it's important. We should try to have people move up as much as they possibly can. Uh, but you, I, I think what is really lost in some ways is that the goal, by, by mathematically impossible to get everyone into the top 20%, right? It doesn't make sense. But I think there, there should be kind of a, a goal that we think of and kind of quantify, how can we make even the poorest 20% of communities in the United States, a place where you can have a dignified life, a place where even if you have a low level education, you can have a job and a stable employment that can provide for a family. And we can have a society where there's a vibrant local community that has institutions that function and bind people together. And it, I think kind of, as I made the film, I became less interested in mobility and more interested in dignity and how you can create a, a community where people can move up, but also the people who don't move up through whatever reason uh, have a shot at a really dignified life. You know, that's oh, really but, interesting. Oh. interesting. If, I could, if I could just follow sure. up on that, Chuck, I mean, it's really interesting because that's a, that was a, a, such an interesting theme in your, in your film, this point about uh, how much that the human spirit is, is, uh, is at stake here. And one of the things I think about in this context is there are certain things that are, that are never going to change, right? So we can't de-invent the birth control pill, which was a big <laughs> technological driver of changes in the way we relate to each other, the, the institution of marriage that uh, across the world, certainly it's true in Italy and, and, and other parts of Europe that, you know, there as well, uh, children are being born out of wedlock, the, the rate of marriage is going down. Um, and yet, as you say, there's still something in communities that's working. And uh, one of the ch unique challenges that we have in the U.S. Uh, that's that's less true in Europe, though Europe is, is becoming more like the U.S. In, in this regard, is that you have, uh, it used to be European countries were nation states, right? Everyone was Italian or everyone was French uh, uh, and, and had some sort of uh, genetic kinship in that regard. That's less true today. Uh, Europe is becoming a bit more like America, where uh, immigrants from around the world who are not genetically related to each other, or at least not going uh, not until you go back a, a lot further back in the tree, uh, are, 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 are working next together, next together, living next to each other. And the question, the challenge that we often have here is, uh, can we have that rooting interest in each other's success, even if we don't have that that bond of kinship, or can we cre recreate that sense of community? And some places seem to be doing it. Maybe those gangs in Stockton are, in a weird way, a, a place where that's happening. Uh, but I'd be interested in, in your thoughts on that particular piece of it. Yeah, I, I think that is it, it is a hundred percent true. And I think that it really is uniquely American, where we have people since the beginning from all over the world, different cultures, different societies, different traditions, different ethnic and racial backgrounds, different religions. And yet we've been able to unite around a kind of common philosophy, a common set of institutions, a common set of beliefs. And in a lot of ways, I think that is the, the huge challenge. It's almost a, a philosophical and ideological challenge. Can we revive what you might loosely call Americanism? Can we revive that as the founding and common shared belief system uh, where, where we can recognize someone that is diverse uh, from us on those kind of birth circumstances grounds and yet recognize the common kind of universal humanity, but more importantly, the common creed or belief or kind of faith and trust in one another. 
And that's something that I, I think is, is, is really in a precarious position right now. I think we are really being ripped apart upon ideological grounds. And I think there is a rising kind of progressive movement that doesn't recognize even the very basics of the constitutional order, uh, the American founding, or those uh, kind, of, kind of aspirational themes in American life. And I think that you know we can always improve upon and come closer to the expression of those themes, but we're really at risk of losing even a kind of coherent framework. And I, I think that you know one thing that gives me hope is that the people who I met in these communities uh, have a much closer sense of and uh, kind of commitment to and faith in that kind of founding American idea than a lot of the people who are in kind of the academic positions or media positions that are attacking it from above. And, and I think that if you really think about what our responsibility is, maybe as those of us on the center right or, or right, um, is we have to articulate that vision in a new way that communicates to people um, across this ever widening divide, across this more diverse country. And I think that we've got to come up with some kind of new moral vocabulary that speaks to people in a way that really reaches their kind of innermost aspirations and desires. And, you know, frankly, if, if I grew up on the south side of Memphis, I don't know if I would really believe in a lot of the ideas on the kind of center right rhetoric, because it doesn't quite go deep enough. It doesn't quite reach in far enough. And I think we have a huge responsibility and a huge opportunity to reformulate a vocabulary of these kind of American ideas that reaches people uh, in, in a way that is emotionally resonant, in a way that connects, and in a way that is more attractive than the alternative. And uh, I, I've tried to, to, to maybe in the film come up with a suggested kind of vocabulary, a suggested way of thinking, but I, I know that there's a lot of more work to be done on that front. So for those of you who are watching us live, if you have any questions, uh, please let us know now. Uh, Ovik, it just so happens the first question we have is actually something I wanted to ask you, uh, which is um, taking off from uh, one of Chris's phrases that he uh, had as he was uh, presenting his film, uh, he noted a loss of social capital. I think that was in the Memphis, Tennessee segment, uh, noting that out of 6,000 residents, there was only 10 nuclear families in that group. Uh, Certainly, the two of us, uh, Ovik, have spent a lot of time talking about uh, or thinking about uh, policies uh, as to, you know, how best might the government dollar be spent to help people. Is there anything in particular that you've thought of that state or federal or even the local level could do to enhance social capital? Because we're, we're always talking about money and, you know, payments. But what about the social capital aspect? What can what can government do, if anything, to to enhance that? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, Chuck. And and uh, you know, actually, our first scholar at FreeOp, FreeOp is a relative. For those of you who don't know, FreeOp, the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity, is a relatively new think tank. We were founded in Austin in 2016. Now we have offices in Austin and D.C. We focus exclusively on free market policies that increase social mobility, that improve the lives of Americans on the bottom half of the economic ladder. And so we think about this question a lot. Our first scholar that we actually hired was a guy named Scott Winship, who had been a colleague of mine at the Manhattan Institute and is now running the U.S. Joint Economic Committee under Mike Lee, where he does research on this very topic of, of social capital. And it's something that, you know, we, we talk about a lot. We've talked about a lot internally. Is what can you actually do? You know, we talk a lot. We've been talking about the breakdown of the family for decades, as you mentioned, Chuck. And yet the statistics get worse pretty much every year. Uh, and I think what that tells us in part is that these problems are not so easily solved by policy, which is kind of Chris's point. You can, to a degree, there are things, there's a conversation that we have not been having that we ought to have about how to reform our welfare system such that it rewards and incentivizes family formation. Uh, clearly, then this is, again, I'm not telling this audience anything that it doesn't already know, uh, but, uh, but the current welfare system at the very least is neutral to family formation and merely by being neutral to family formation, you can be destructive to it uh, because traditionally it's work uh, that has, has been a big part of, of family formation. So that's, 
that's a conversation we have to do a better job of having. And part of that, I think, is uh, de uh, de religionizing it, in the sense that uh, so there are so many people who I think, from a progressive standpoint, would hear the message. But as soon as they hear someone say, "You got to do this because this is the Judeo-Christian tradition," they freak out. Um, and so we've got to figure out how to how to have messengers that can that can that can make that point, but where the, the but where it's not done from a religious standpoint, but really done from more of a progressive with a progressive tone to it. I think that's that's important. But I also think, as we alluded to earlier, that there are certain parts of this that are not going away. You're not going to put the birth control genie back in the bottle. Other technologies as well may, have have effectively technologically decoupled procreation from marriage in a way that is not going to be reversed. Um, and that is, a, that is a bigger challenge than I think a lot of us in the conservative world have, have wanted to confront. Uh, and actually, you know, I'm really interested in hearing from Chris on, on this question because, you know, Chris, you, you managed to get, now you said the, your third film in front of PBS, you, you've built networks and relationships uh, in, in the more progressive side of, of the media market. How did you do that? How did you? How did you? Your 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 films are forthright in 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 uh, in talking about the breakdown of the family, and yet you've managed to to get an audience and a hearing for that. Yeah, you know, the, I mean, the first three films I did were were quite uh, different and apolitical. So I did a film about Mongolian nomads. Uh, I did another film about the Uyghur minority of China. Uh, and then I did a third film about people up to 100 years old that compete in Olympic sports. So really apolitical. This was the first time I've delved into the more political side. And I think, you know, I've really learned two things. One is that uh, once I was making a more politically oriented film from a kind of center right point of view, uh, all of the kind of traditional uh, documentary funders uh, basically wouldn't give me the time of day. I kind of was unable to raise money in the traditional way, had to rely on uh, private foundations who are more philosophically aligned. Um, and then, you know, frankly, it, it, it's, it's a very fine line, you know, trying to get a, uh, a kind of center right perspective film onto a, a center left or even further than center left uh, uh, kind of kind of industry and community is something that I had to work very hard to do, which was present a case that accurately reflected my point of view, my perspective, and what I believe but present it in a way and using a tone that doesn't alienate people who might come from a different uh, political philosophy. And, and then additionally, uh, you know, the, the very nice producers uh, and executive producers at PBS uh, put the film through an extremely rigorous line by line, fact check, tone check, uh, kind of scene check, uh, legal check. I mean, they really uh, were very, very, uh, um, kind of methodical and thorough in a way that I hadn't experienced, I think, because, um, you know, it just is held to a higher standard. And that's something that I accepted and understand and, and tried to be uh, flexible with. Um, but, you know, I, I, I really hope that I made something that speaks, that kind of preaches to the choir, uh, but can then also uh, reach out to the people that are outside of the kind of traditional uh, kind of think tank or public policy world. And, um, you know, we'll see. I, I, I'm, I'm excited to see how it lands and where it goes. Um, but I, I, I'm optimistic that I think I present a case that, you know, if you care about people, if you care about the poor, if you care about, you know, the struggling communities in our country, at least, at least consider the idea that the system that we have today, which spends an enormous sum of money, uh, isn't delivering the kind of results that we all want. And I think if I can establish that as even kind of a critical function, uh, I'd be happy with the, the, the film and, and its impact. You know, one of the interesting things that uh, both of you touched on uh, regarding uh, our uh, left of center elites uh, and their antipathy toward the discussion of family, I don't know if either of you had seen the study so that it was publicized sometime in the last year that said that those people who are on the progressive left, if you look at their divorce rate and out of wedlock birth rate, they're actually living the lives uh, that they claim to uh, abhor. In other words, very low out of birth, uh, out of uh, wedlock births, a uh, very low divorce, uh, very intact families. Uh, so, so they're living the proper life. It's just that for whatever reason, I guess they don't see that they can what pass judgment on on everyone else? I mean, 
why do you think that that is going on? Why the discrepancy there? You know, there's actually a, a book that was written about this, Red Families, Blue Families, I think it was, or maybe I've got the title reversed, that was just about this, the fact that it's these blue, uh, upper middle class elite blue states like Massachusetts that do the best job on some of these social capital statistics that, uh, that you can measure, uh, like divorce rate, family formation, uh, et cetera. Another piece of it, by the way, we should mention is Asian Americans. Asian Americans actually on all this uh, kind of social capital uh, statistics way outperform whites. Their divorce rate is much lower. Their illegitimacy rate is much lower. Their college degree or college graduation rates are much higher. Um, and, and that at least should give us, you know, to, to the degree there are people out there who say, well, if we have lots of immigration, it's all over. Um, you know, yeah. uh, there's at least the Asians at least pose a counter argument or a counter set of statistics to that. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's 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 a big challenge, and I, I you know I've got to say I'm I'm curious to know like I, I think what happens is a lot of people get triggered. I think is the short answer to your question, Chuck. I think I think there are people who hear, uh, uh, you know, maybe they hear uh, uh, you know it, it coming out of an evangelical or a Catholic background, and if they don't identify with that particular background, they're like, hey, you know, you're trying to impose your religion on me, you're trying to proselytize me, or I just don't like that. It gives me the heebie-jeebies on some subconscious level, and they just tune it out. Right? They just become uh, hostile to it, even if on the substance they agree. Um, you know, I can I can speak to my mama. My mom is a devout Hindu. She goes to temple every. She's actually the chair of the board of directors of her local temple in suburban Detroit, and she's very much like that. Everything about her life is conservative in the way she lives it, but uh, uh, religious conservatives give her the heebie-jeebies. And uh, and and so I think there's something there about the way we talk about this stuff that's really important. And that leads me to a question I have for you, Chris, which is, I got to know, like, what, what was left on the cutting room floor? I, ha I, I, I can relate to your, your point about, uh, about the exacting standards when you try to put something up in a, in a uh, left of center media environment, because I do that uh, regularly in my own work. So, <laughs> I, but I'm curious to know uh, uh, what that was like for you. you what know, are some of the good things that aren't in the film? Well, you know, there's two kind of layers of, of editing. One is that you end up actually using less than 1% of all the footage that you shot. Yeah. So it's actually well less than 1%. It's a fraction of 1%. So as I edited the film into a kind of a feature length project, um, I cut 99 point something percent out. And then as we went through the editorial process with PBS, I, you know, they were really, um, there were certain times where uh, it would say, you know, they say, well, you know, we really don't like this uh, line because it says X, Y, and Z. And I said, well, is there any specific objection? Um, you know, I, I've sourced it, I've cited it, I've included it in the appendix. I said, well, it doesn't feel like that's true. <laughs> so, so you're kind of like, oh boy, okay, well, we're gonna have to really kind of work on it. And we went back and forth and I tried to substantiate my arguments. I tried to do some uh, some data crunching. I tried to take it step by step. And there were just certain things that I think, you know, uh, we were able to find common ground on, on most, on, on most everything, but there are certain sensitivities. I think if you're looking at anything that relates to race, there's another huge sensitivity, which I understand. I mean, you have to be, as a, you know, as a white filmmaker, I have to be uh, uh, even more kind of thoughtful uh, and, and, um, and kind of rigorous in how I approach uh, a film section in the city of Memphis where I don't have the same experience and, re and references. But, you know, I, I think those were the areas of the highest sensitivity, the highest kind of, um, kind of, kind of threshold of, uh, of, of proof was required. Uh, certain things got lost, but I don't think the overall message got lost. But I, I, I would say this, and I think it's really important that plays to your point, we have to come up with a new vocabulary of how we speak about these issues, and especially when we're reaching out uh, to people that may not have the kind of white evangelical or traditional kind of, uh, uh, kind of right of center cultural connotations and references. But I, I think it's possible, and, and I'll tell you why. I, I you know, I always, I, I never let uh, the subjects or the participants in a film see the film as it's a work in progress. I only show them after the film is already done and really won't be changed. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you that the people that I captured um, in all three cities, and really most deeply and profoundly, the people in Memphis uh, and Stockton that were, you know, the African American and Latino communities. Uh, I shared the film with them. I was you know, always nervous. How, how, how are they going to interpret it? And 
they loved it. They were just, I mean, calling me in tears saying, you know, Katrina, one of the women in, in South Memphis said, you know, um, I, I didn't know how it was going to turn out. I was so excited. I invited over my entire family to watch the film together and we were all crying because you've caught something that is beautiful and meaningful and something that I could never express in words, but I feel like you captured the exact things that I wanted to say. And that was a moment where I said, absolutely, we nailed it. You know, I really like feel a, a kind of duty to present people uh, with the benefit of the doubt, to present people's deepest kind of uh, desires and longings and perspectives in a way that I provide the kind of contextualization and creative choices uh, and, and aesthetic considerations, but I wanted to channel their voices. And that to me was the greatest endorsement in this whole process. And I, I was proud of the product that, that we finished up with. That's amazing. How'd you get them to open up like that? What was it? Because you, you got a lot of people to say things about what they were doing with their lives that uh, normally people don't say on camera. Time, you know, it's time and commitment. You have to show that you are going to be a person that sticks around, a person that shows up, a person that will answer their phone call at 2 a.m., uh, a person that seeks to understand them. And I think, you know, what I learned is that if you are just willing to listen um, and willing to take people's lives seriously, um, and you have to keep in mind, this is a kind. these are the kind of communities where um, what they usually get from someone that is wearing a, a sport coat or a government ID is condescension, uh, is kind of patronizing, is kind of bureaucratic, uh, is really doesn't care about them. So, you know, when I show up at maybe a community meeting or a church and I'm the, you know, here to, to listen and talk to you and, and really kind of kind of understand your experiences, people are ready to open up. And then you develop trust over time so that you're literally in the room filming at the birth of their children, or you are two feet away from the casket when someone is killed in the streets. Uh, and, and, and you really have developed those bonds and that trust. And I, I think, you know, for those of you who are listening today, it's like a lot of question is how do I get involved? I'm, I'm maybe uncomfortable, but it's like, if you go and you show a respect, if you show an interest, if you show a genuine, kind of curiosity about communities that are very different than your own, uh, you'll be welcomed with open arms. And I found that the, the, the poorest communities that I've spent time in were, were, you know, the most open, the most receptive, the most kind, the most considered, the most eloquent uh, in a way that, um, that I think surprised me and really, sh you know, proved to me that these are places that are worth um, investing in. These are people that are worth uh, taking seriously that are worth listening to, that are worth um, really kind of going to the mats and revising our policies to try to help. Um, and, and again, these are people that the kind of conservative universal themes of family and community and meaningful work, those are at the heart and soul of these places. And if we can tap into that, I think we can have a much more successful um, kind of policy discussion and a much more successful effort for reform. So Chris, we only have a few moments left together uh, today. Um, one of the questions that has been asked uh, that if you could just uh, give us your, your Cliff Notes version of this, you talked about your ancestral village in, in Italy, uh, a, a place of some 2000 people. Are there any uh, places or regions either in the US or around the world that have come to your attention that are doing it right? And, and what are they doing? What's unique about them? Yeah, I mean, I, I that's a that's that's a great question. I mean, I, I think you have um, that's a big question. I, I would say this kind of tentatively. I, I haven't thought this through, but I'm going to kind of go with what I think. So, I mean, certainly you have some religious communities in the United States that are very tight knit. Um, if you look at the kind of Mormon culture and community, um, that's a kind of community that has a really kind of a strong commitment to those institutions and values that help people at the bottom. They have a kind of organic social safety net that is really something remarkable uh, to, to observe. Um, and then if you look at, uh, you know, countries and my travels around the world as a filmmaker, if you look at, uh, if you look at some of the Asian countries, if you look at uh, certainly if you go to, to, to India, you have places that are in this kind of situation of, in some cases, extreme material poverty, um, but they have a kind of a, kind of a cohesive kind of cultural community, family bonds, community bonds, that once you pair that with the engines and opportunities of capitalism and 
production and entrepreneurship is really something to behold. So I think that if you are looking in the kind of near to midterm horizon, uh, I think the growth and creativity and potential from, uh, from China and India particularly is going to be astonishing. Um, I, you know, and I, I think it's really sad. I had some friends that were from uh, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, from kind of Im Im immigrants from India and they said, oh man, the United States is so messed up. There's more opportunity in India now. And I just was like, no, that can't be, you know, what are we going to do? What can we put together? What can we learn? What can we kind of, how can we transform the kind of top line, incredible economic engine of the United States and then reinvigorate the kind of bottom end social and community and institutional fabric? Because I think if we, if we can repair really what's at the bottom uh, and combine it with the incredible innovation that we have at the top, uh, we'll have a country that can continue to be uh, really the, the the bright spot in the world uh, for a hundred years to come. And I I, I believe that fundamentally. And I, I don't I, I don't claim that that we have all the answers. I think we should look anywhere and everywhere. If someone's doing something better than we are, let's copy it, let's replicate it, and let's improve it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think it, we've had a, an amazing discussion. A great film, America Lost. Uh, look for it upcoming on PBS. Uh, these are our foundational questions that really go to the heart of, of the American existence and, and how we as a nation can uh, prosper together, how we can thrive, how, how we can improve uh, the lives of, of all people who live in this great nation. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Chris Rufo, the uh, director, the creator of America Lost, who's the a director of the Discovery Institute's Center on Wealth and Poverty up in, up in Seattle, Washington, uh, as well as Ovik Roy. Uh, Ovik is the president and founder of the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity here in Austin, Texas. I'm Chuck DeVore. I'm vice president of National Initiatives for the Texas Public Policy Foundation.